Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 28th of April, 2023, we're going to get to learn about catching redfish with Alan Curie. And, and Gary Bagley doesn't know it, but he's going to be helping me learn how to do this doggone half hitch and whip finish that he's so good at. We're going to actually do it on screen. More of that in a few minutes. But anyway, we're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho. And let me spotlight our featured talent tonight. You didn't know you were talent, did you, Alan? You thought you were just some psycho who was going to show us how to do. Oh, you are. You're, you're the talent tonight. Anyhow, just, go ahead. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and we're going to duck out for a moment and we're going to read the uh, introduction. Okay. Uh, Alan Curie retired from the U.S. Army Dental Corps in 2001 and has lived year-round in Naples, Florida ever since. He quickly became a passionate saltwater fly fisherman after joining the local fly fishing club, the Backcountry Fly Fishers, and that was in 2003. He spends a lot of time fly fishing the coastal estuaries and backcountry through Collier and Lee counties. Southwest Florida has a very dependable redfish, snook, and tarpon fisheries that are heavily fished during the tourist season, which runs from December to April. During this period, the morning low, low spring tides often provides excellent sight fishing opportunities. These tailing fish can be best targeted by pulling skiffs, wading, and kayaks. Tonight, Alan is tying two fly he uses to catch tailing redfish. They are the brown mangrove crab and the black foam gurgler. It's all yours, Alan. Go for it. Okay. Thank you, Al. It's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, and talk to such a talented audience. Uh, I uh, have a couple redfish flies that I use pretty much exclusively in the skinny water uh, here in Southwest Florida. Um, I've found like, I think you all have uh, seen with your trout, not every trout stream uh, has, uh, you know, the same uh, flies that you would use. And I find that also with some of the saltwater fish, uh, this brown mangrove crab that I'm going to start out with today, the colors and such uh, don't seem to work down in the Keys very well. It's uh, a different habitat with a lot less um, dense mangrove forest down there, as well as uh, last week or two weeks ago, I was up in uh, just north of Crystal River, kind of central Florida, uh, in a kayak tournament up there around Yankee Town. And uh, I threw this fly to several redfish and large sheep's head with not a not even a look. So um, this particular pattern, if you bring it down here to Collier and Lee County, um, I think it'll be very effective. But again, no guarantees outside of this area. Let me uh, hold up a, a recipe. And if you want to take a screenshot or a photo of that, um, it'll tell you everything that we're going to used to tie this crab. Let's see if you can, I'll give this a few seconds up here. Um, but basically there's a lot of uh, the gleasy fiber to form the body. I find weed guards to be essential down here. Uh, sometimes we're losing a lot of our natural grasses like turtle grass but we've gained a lot of drift algae and things like that. So um, putting that fly real close to the uh, fish is key so you don't have to strip it a lot, but using a single post or double post weed guard is, is pretty uh, important there to keep your hook from being fouled. Um, I'm gonna, let's see if I can show you just a layout of the materials that I listed here. I'm gonna pick up one of these little USB cameras and uh, see if that, yeah, that's not so bad. This is a layout here of the tray. Um, again, you'll see the EP fibers, which I take some of it and blend it. Brown and dark brown uh, creates a little mottled appearance. And we're gonna do a little egg sack with some dubbing and uh, 
I'm going to use bee chain eyes today. Again, this fly, I'm looking for tailing fish or crawling fish. And uh, so you don't need anything heavy. Uh, if you're going to be in a couple feet of water, of course, that's a different, different story. So uh, this is the, the fly. Um, you can see the bead chain eyes in the front. The body is a blend of that brown and dark brown, the glissy fiber. And I've got some uh, gold crystal flash in the tail, which is pretty much a dark brown bucktail. So we'll, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'll take this out and I'm gonna, this is I believe a number four, which is a real nice size. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started on a uh, number two, make it a little bit easier to show you what's going on. Uh, the hook again is a B10S. And I believe we've got a number two here. That should be pretty snug. Get my glasses on. The main thing I like to do is get those uh, eyeballs on right away. Get our thread wrap here. Bring it down right back to the bend of the hook. Nip that off. If you all have any questions, please, uh, you know, go ahead and ask them through, I believe, the chat on our Zoom. Excuse me for blocking that video there. With a number two hook, I find the large B chain eyes work real well. I do like a figure eight. I'm putting a fair amount of pressure with this thread. It's uh, pretty stout, the 210 denier flat wax nylon. Kind of under wraps there. So we got. Okay, let's see. I got a question here from uh, Fred Dupree. Pray. Rusting, I, I do not experience, Fred, any problem with the rust. Um, the main problem I do encounter with this particular pattern is the gold bead chain. If you're not real careful and it's nice to have a little bit of water with you, um, if you're out six, eight hours during the day and you've cast this fly early in the morning, then the tides come out and you go to a, a different type of pattern targeting snook or tarpon and you don't rinse that fly off after an hour or two in the salt, these eyes will corrode and uh, they just don't have the, uh, the shininess, which I think is real important for redfish in particular. But the, the actual hook, if it's, you know, if I leave it for several days, especially where the vice has gripped the, uh, the hook and maybe scratch the finish, I will get some rust. But other than that, uh, my main concern is the eyeballs rather than anything on the hook. Okay, I've, we're gonna go ahead and uh, we got to get our bucktail here. Let's see, where did, yeah, excuse me. I've got uh, some brown bucktail, but that's in a different room for some reason. So we'll go ahead with a little bit of black. And uh, I'm using the end of the, the bucktail. So if you want to get the tips, whether it's brown or a dark brown color, so that when you put it on, you don't have a lot of flaring. So I'll get that. What I like to do is Get as much of the short fibers out of here. 
And then when I tie this in, I want it to butt up right behind the eyes. That way the body is uniform along the shank of the hook. This is still a bit long, get some of these. You could do this probably and do quite well with a black purple, a lot of, a lot of baby tarpon go along the mangroves, uh, a lot of snook. This is a great fly for sheep's head. Um, but everything here in Southwest Florida, they grow up in the back country, got real dense mangrove forests. And uh, pretty much if it's in the water, it's, I've caught it on this fly. So you can kind of have that tail start to go down the bend of the hook. You can see the uniformity there by tying that in right up behind the bead chain eyes. Um, and again, I'm going to put a use that, uh, try to add a little gold here. This is gold crystal flash. Let's cut that off and then we'll be tying in a little group like that. It's about good there. I just have it a little shorter than the bucktail. Few wraps. And uh, kind of interesting, in the last year I've added uh, kind of an egg sack in this bend of the hook. And it seems to get improve the eat ratio or my percentage of getting a hook up if I have that orange egg sack. So we're going to create a little bit of a dubbing loop, put a couple wraps of some ice dubbing in a shrimp pink color. Just form my loop and come forward, let this hang out of the way. Uh, there's my wax. See if I can move. There we are. And then the tool. That's a little more than I normally would need, but I'm going to trim this back just a bit before I spin it. Okay. And should I give her a spin? There we go. Right, right up where we taught tied in that crystal flash. That's enough, two wraps. Okay. So this is going to ride hook point up with the weight of, you know, the large bead chain eyes. And in this position, we add the uh, EP fibers. Um, you got a little, little bit for the first tie in and then we'll continue on with the others. Probably will get about five batches. What I do is go over and I 
the weight of the thread and bobbin. Now when I, I'm gonna turn this just a skosh. I do one wrap and then I really drive this second wrap back into the material. And I'm putting a lot of pressure. Do about three wraps, four wraps, come forward and then wrap back over that thread and that holds everything in place. Um, and I like to trim as I go, get it close. Then later on, we'll be doing a little more trimming. So there's our, if you got any hairs going forward, they're just gonna get in your way. So you can get rid of those guys. Then we'll go ahead and uh, Got a much longer piece. We'll just start even it out. And again, it's like a figure eight wrap. And once you got this down, you can tie a whole bunch of saltwater patterns that have like that Merkin body to it. Whoops. Let me back up. <laughs> Uh, that's a, I haven't done that, but that happens when you're on Zoom. Okay. Let's redo that, slow down. Get that in position. Come up. Pull this back. You want that thread to be right up against those wraps. Pull them back, coming forward. Try to do that a little smoother so you I think a lot of you know know what I'm trying to do, but I'd like to show that a little better. We got room for a couple more here before we uh, whip finish and add on a weed guard again over. Just kind of let it rest position. Bring my I'm pulling this thread kind of up and back and then just in front of that last section. Pull down, drive that thread backwards so it really can come forward. You'll find when you tie these or fish these that uh, like on a number two here, if I have a real bushy clump, uh, it impacts a lot how this fly sinks. Um, sometimes you want, want it to be fairly bushy, um, especially if you have a heavier, like lead eyes. But uh, you just play with it based on, you know, try to standardize things a little bit. And I'll talk to you about standardization in a moment. Um, I'm going to put a small bit right in front. We got a little gap there between the eyes. It's not like deer hair where you try to pack the hell out of it. But excuse me, just thin down this. I just like to cover part of the eyes here. So that goes over. And I like being able to control the material a little bit. If you cut equal lengths for each of these five or six sections that you're putting on, it's real hard to grab them. But if you see how this extends out, I can control that. But if it's the same width, you don't know if you're grabbing the previous bunch that you tied in or not. So that's a little tip there to Okay, this is close. We're gonna whip finish and then trim the shape. Got all that back. We're gonna be adding a weed guard. So I just wanna make sure we don't have any loosening of the thread that's in place. We got a fairly bushy 
fly, but we're going to trim it back here with the scissors. Um, all right, here's here's our basic fly. I know it's not in focus right now. The why I wanted to show you was I've got a template. Maybe that. There we go. And uh, if you have the fly there, we'll trim it. Try to do it to that shape, and I put it. Put that template on the counter, lay my fly on top of that, and that gives me a general idea how I want to trim. Okay, um, I'm going to be doing a little trimming out of view here. I apologize for that. But first thing I want to do, when you pull on one side of the fly, make sure you grip it like I'm doing here. So I can pull here. I'm not going to move anything. It's in there pretty well, but it's not locked in. But I'm flattening the, the body of the crab or the fibers so it's a lot more flat. Now I can trim. Uh, my first orientation is in relation to those bead chain eyes. I'm going to be cutting straight just behind center, straight across, like a 90 degree to the shank of the hook. But there's something similar, you know, with a template. I think you can see that we're not far off. I wanted to uh, go ahead and put a weed guard on this fly. So we'll go ahead and get our brown thread put in. I sometimes use a 16 or 20 pound mono, 20 for uh, a single stock we guard and then I'll do a double with 16 do something different here and I, I think this is a more attractive we guard I've got two ends of a 50 pound hard mason just with a candle and get a nice nice shape there at the end much better than uh, let's go ahead and trim this off just want that to be about I think that's going to work good. So we've got this. What I like to do also is take a little pliers. This tip here that you cut clean, try to squish that, flatten it out. Kind of a shovel shaped after you take some pliers. Give it a good squeeze, bend it up. That flattens the tip. I'll give it a little more pressure. There we go. Usually about four turns, five turns. Just rotate that and that clears that opening. Now I can put a little more pressure. want to with pressure on the thread, bend this forward. Come behind the wee guard. Now we can come forward and finish one more whip finish. Snug that. And she's ready to fish. Again, I would spend a little more time just smoothing off the corners, but that's your basic brown mangrove crab. Uh, actually, I kind of like the way the black is there. 
Um, you can sometimes get a very dark brown. You got the gold flash. So there she is. Sounds uh, John good. Wright wants, wants to, John Wright wants to know if you have a picture or drawing of the crab you were trying to imitate. I, I do. This is uh, an excellent book, Saltwater Prey by Dr. Aaron Adams. He's with BTU, now BTT. Uh, been with them for probably 20 years. BTT. This is the actual crab, the, the male. It's got the... Uh, mm -hmm. Bonefish Tarpon Trust. Yeah. Um, I'm getting reflection. The top photo is the belly of a male crab. And it's got the red tip claws. And it, that's the bottom photo of the top side. They're a very mottled, black, light gray, brownish crab. Um, these are the uh, Gamagatsu B10S number four a little smaller fly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tie this pattern on a number two. And uh, the problem with redfish, this next pattern, I'm going to put it in the vise for you all. This is on a number four. It's a little smaller, but again, I think small, it works really good. A topwater fly called the gurgler. Let me go ahead and hold up the recipe for you and talk you through it. There's one thing, I hope that that comes through okay, but there's one thing with this pattern that uh, when you have, you know, the potential for snook or uh, tarpon, you're gonna want a 25, 30 pound leader. And you probably need a number two or number one size in the B10S stinger, a little larger gap and a much stouter hook. The number four is really nice for redfish up to about 10 pounds. Beyond that, uh, if you start getting over slot red, you probably want to go to the number two hook. There's quite a difference in the strength of those two hooks. I'm going to tie this uh, gurgler pattern in the, in the uh, number two size. The main thing that I find here on this fly is you got to have uh, – a good foam body. I found three millimeter thick foam. Uh, I could get it online. Most of the stuff you find in the craft shops are two millimeter, just too flimsy. And this uh, bill that creates the uh, gurgling or kind of the spitting of the water with the bubbles and actually makes a fairly audible gurgle or pop, like a popping fork, uh, requires a stouter foam. So you can get it in like uh, nine by 12 sheets online. Then you just cut. And this is a uh, like a cut portion here. You can see one end is tapered down and then the thicker part will I'll be using for the bill. So uh, let's go ahead and I'll show you how to tie this guy. In just a little bit bigger hook. And one thing with redfish is that occasionally they'll broadside the fly, hit it from the side, but if they're coming from behind, then you see them like, like a submarine coming up. They come up from behind, and they have a wake, and if this tail is real long in length, it kind of will push the fly out of the way. Occasionally they'll come from the side and mouth it and uh, get a thread base and then we'll put in the tail. Again, I'm using the 210 denier, wrapping. Bucktail very at the tip, tip of the uh, bucktail here. So we'll grab a little, little bit of that. I don't find it necessary to put bucktail the whole length of the shaft like I did on the previous pattern. Just, again, I can put a fair amount of pressure on this because we're using the tips of the, from the bucktail, which is fairly solid. I'm gonna come back. I like to add a little bit of uh, crystal flash 
In this case, I'm going to add a little bit of a blue gold, kind of varied length, something like this. It's kind of loose there at first. Try to. Now, I'm going to uh, add our uh, first layer or lay the foam in place. As I mentioned, I've tapered it towards the front. So I need, I'll bring my thread forward. And about an eye length behind is where we'll tie in. I could put some cyanoacrylate or adhesive there. I don't really find it necessary. I think I just, and I'm doing it in sections, going back, grab a little bit. I think that shows up fairly well. And one more. Purple Estaz for the underbody. Let's tie that in. See, yeah, a couple legs on each side. It seems, uh, I don't know, seems helpful. What I'll do is just figure eight one in each section and come come up a couple and we'll do the other put another set in so those are in place then i'm going to come up to that lead one and this is where we're going to tie everything down Tie off our Estes. Get rid of the excess. Okay. Then the top part of the gurgler is going to fold right over. The legs will be forced down a bit. Really pushing pretty hard there. Do a, about three wraps in that slot that you just created. And you really hog down. Mono eyes will put that in this groove here and they will help support the bill of this gurgler so it doesn't wear out too quick. Just, I think you can see a little bit what I'm, what I'm doing there. And these, the eyes themselves, the round portion, of course, help support. Then we just go up underneath. I'm going to come up under there and we'll whip finish. I like to tighten that knot up, pull back, pull forward with a tool. I'm going to show you after we get this out, we've got, I don't know how much you can see, but I think when you look in this area, you can see you got a nice curve to that bill. If I cut right, I've seen some folks cut right here, you know, cut right at the very front portion eye of the hook. I like to come forward, put a little tension pulling, put quick snap and that's the bill there and that's gonna work real well now the legs I'm not too concerned about length they looks like they want to cross but we'll just cut those just about where the the hook point would be just a little something there and few extras here. Okay. 
And I think this guy definitely do the job on tarp and snook. Like I said, I wanted to make it a little easier on the demo side, time with a number two. But that's the, uh, the gurgler that I find extremely effective when you've got an awful lot of uh, floating algae, just, you know, you may have eight inches to the bottom of the mud and the, the reds will be burrowing through that drift algae, looking for crabs and things. And you can't throw a crab down in there, but you can get their attention with a gurgler. And usually you can throw this very close because it's a very, it lands super light, give it one or two pops and they'll, they'll jump right on it if that they're all interested. And sometimes you don't get a hookup. It's maybe 30% to 50% of the time that they try to eat it. But uh, that's, uh, that's the gurgler. Okay, going to the weekly tip. Gary Bagley in the recent past demonstrated a half hitch and whip finish the way he does it. And I, I've got to admit, it's got me flummoxed. Not totally, but anyway, we're going we're gonna to add Gary here, and he is going to be doing that uh, weekly tip. Okay. What I was planning on doing, I'll show you real quick, uh, just a couple steps as to how I ended up starting to, uh, to use my bodkin to do the, to do the whip finish and the half hitch. Of course, just small flies, dry flies, and nymphs and such. The half hitch tool, wrap the thread around once. You guys don't need to see that. Everybody probably knows it. Uh, is great. This fly, this is obviously not going to be any good. So once I started tying flies like this and, and others, I started thinking, okay, how am I going to get, how am I going to finish the fly off up here? So I would start off with, actually, it's without the bodkin, start off with two fingers and actually do a half hitch motion. And then I had this uh, big loop up here. Of course, I could pinch it together, but somehow I, some, at some point in time, I've got to turn loose of that loop. And I'm just, and it's inevitable. I'm going to bang down some fibers, maybe these, maybe these. So what I started doing was holding that loop up, put my bodkin in, and then I could come down and, and I got complete control. I could keep, put the thread exactly where I want it, even finish on the side if I want. And that got a little cumbersome, making a big loop and holding my finger on it and then reaching over and getting the bodkin. So I just started holding the bodkin in my hand mm -hmm. while I tie. So same motion, just standard half hitch motion. I come up and around. And there's a bodkin half hitch. Mm -hmm. Now, in that same time frame, I had learned to do a, a whip finish by hand. Same uh, same thing, except to come up under the thread with the bodkin in my hand still, and I can do a whip finish. And my bodkin's right there, and I don't have to worry about trapping any materials. Mm -hmm. Now, cool. that said, you can do it with scissors as well. Utilize the scissors as opposed to the bodkin, but if you have, if you have the right kind of scissors, you need to have some with a tip on it. And I don't consider this a negative, but these are uh, serrated blades. And they're serrated all the way to the end. And about 30% of the time, maybe 40, I end up cutting the thread. I'll saw right through it. So I generally tie with my scissors in hand and a bodkin. I tie like this. I'm just keep them there all the time. Like that way I can get to my bodkin for a half hitch and or I can get to my scissors, cut whatever I want. That uh, so, I, if you don't mind me joining joining you, I'm going to go a side by side here. And I'm, I've got to try this because I'm also telling you that I've been, well, I haven't had the same success with it that, that you have. And I'll just add a hook to the vise here. Maybe you can kind of talk me through this. Now, the half hitch seems to work fairly well for me.
and I think you're holding it like this. Is that correct? Like that. Yep. All across, right. Across the palm, across the palm of my hand, and I got the pad of my index finger on the vodka needle. Okay. Um. Oh, well, that's how. <laughs> it, oh, hey, light goes on. The light goes <laughs> on. Okay, got it. Yeah. You know what now I was trying to do? It, if I, I can do it, anybody to, can. I was trying to hold it clear out there like that, and I got to tell you the truth. I was there. I was massacring myself, quite frankly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get you get it back in there like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just like so. That okay. I got it. Thank you. That's a half hitch. Are you going to do a whip finish? No, the whip finish. I I would in, really really would embarrass myself, and uh, <laughs> so I am going to not do the whip finish. And uh, Gary, any anything else that you want to uh, talk to us about there? No, that that's pretty much it. Sharing on BTs and Evelyn likes to draw, and I'll tell you what, we're just delighted to. Uh, to feature Evelyn tonight. There we go. Okay. There you go. Got you now. <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Someday I'll get the right colors. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been to the store, to the uh, art store yet to get other colors because this one here is uh Love that one too. Love it a lot. Wow. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, the the bar the eyes are there, the blue, but it's not um oh there that's better. Oh yeah, nice see the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yep, love that one too. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Oh, thank you. I've missed you guys. <laughs> if you look real careful, it's the life cycle of a mayfly starting down at the bottom. Oh, you've got the nymph. And then you come up in the bend of the hook, and you've got the emerger, and then you've got the the dun, and finally the spinner. And I think that was quite cool. Well, the fellow that tied it requests to remain anonymous, probably because we'd all <laughs> think he was crazy as heck. So we'll just leave it. It's either that or he doesn't have anything to do with the evening. And I can recommend a couple of good uh, television shows in case he needs them. <laughs> anyway. And I can see him up there on screen chuckling away there, and, and as well he should. But anyway, cool. the thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, I had some ideas in regards to this. Participation and a possible book. One of the things that I, that I wanted to talk about here, a possible book. What we like to do next season is to write a book with all of you. Now, that doesn't mean that all of you are going to be in the book, but what we would like to do is through the summer, email. Email, email, email. I'm, I'm going to say it again, Chris. Okay, good. You did good. You did it for me. Then the emails with your ideas. What we're working on is a book with a rough title, and all of our books have rough titles. Sometimes they become the actual title. Other times they don't. But this one is the perfect presentation. What does it take to make a perfect presentation? Well, as an example, in the very recent past, I think it was last week or the week before, Dutch Bachman talked to us about monofilament, nylon monofilament, and fluorocarbon monofilament. Well, let's talk about, let's set that aside for a second, and let's talk about something else for a minute. I know it's going to seem disjointed, but they're going to come together uh, eventually. But back in the 80s, I remember very well that if you were a fly tire and even admitted to using any kind of a jig hook with lead on it or not lead on it, you'd mm. be shot for being a trader. Mm. Fly fishermen did not use jig hooks, period. Well, guess what? Fast forward to today and what is check nymphing? Okay, don't shoot me, please, please. But you kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. The jig hook is not quite as bad uh, today as it used to be. All right, set that aside. Back in the day, though, in the 80s, there were a lot of us using a rigging called the riffle hitch. 
or in some cases was called the rifflin hitch. A lot of steelheaders used it, and they would tie this hitch uh, to the front of the fly. After you tie the fly on, you throw a couple of half hitches on it, throw it out, and it makes it kind of go cross current. Well, that was cool. There was a bunch of us Montana guides, so it didn't take us long to figure out. We didn't want our flies going cross current. What we really wanted was a good presentation of a stonefly nymph deep in the water column. Well, the riffle hitch worked really well for doing that as well. And here's one of the things that that I uh, that I noticed when fishing the spring creeks. And Tim Flagler, on one of his presentations recently, showed nymphs in the water floating naturally that he photographed, and then flies in the water floating tied to a tippet. Imagine my finger, water column here, water column here, okay? The nymphs, the natural ones, my finger is floating along, and there's a nymph, and here comes another one, and here comes another one, and then here's the one that I cast with the tippet coming from up above, and my fly goes along like this. Why? Because the tippet's holding it up. Do you think that's a good presentation? Well, I don't, and why did the riffle hitch work? It's because the riffle hitch is a half hitch that you put kind of in the middle of the fly after you've tied it to the to the um, to the hook eye, and you're manufacturing a makeshift jig type hook, especially if it's a weighted nymph. Hmm. So, what does that have to do with floral carbon? I'm going to get to that. <laughs> floral carbon and monofilament. One of the problems that we had back in the day, we didn't have floral carbon then. I was using mono. Uh, um, nylon at the time it was it was a, a pretty uh, stiff mono and when you throw a half hitch on the nymph and fish it down through the run a few times it worked really well and just like it was supposed to do when you'd hook a fish it would slip off and you'd be able to fight the fish on the hook eye that said you usually had to cut it off and tie it back on because there was a kink at the, that you got got in that because of the memory in the mono. Is there a mono that that wouldn't happen with? Uh, is there an island? What, what, what happens with fluorocarbon? Those are all questions I don't have the answer to, but we have a whole ton of experts here tonight and every night watching on Facebook, on YouTube, that have answers to questions like that. How do you get a good drift through the water with so making let, it look natural? So the book, to clarify what you've just said, because you said the book is about making a good presentation. Mm -hmm. Some people might have thought, oh, a Zoom presentation. No, we're talking about presentation of a fly to a fish. Thank you. Now, how would I, I'd never get through the day if it wasn't you keeping me straight. <laughs> well, Thank it's you, because dear. you confuse me lots of times. That's good. But anyway, so you understand the perfect presentation isn't Zoom. Yeah, it's the perfect presentation of a fly. And I've just thrown a couple of ideas out that I've used over the years. And in fact, I hate to admit it, but I even use jig hooks today. They're called something else, but they're still jig hooks. And um, anyway, I'm throwing the subject open now to everybody going to remove my spotlight. Oh, and something else too. If you're concerned about your ability to write it, don't worry about it. Get it down on paper. And if, you know, if you're a, a little flummoxed about all that, we can, we're pretty good at fixing stuff. Yeah. So but, if you need some help with that. But the main thing is don't send us a 10,000 word essay with 50 photographs without having sent a query letter first, because one of the most important things about writing for publication is you contact the editor with a query letter. Three or four sentences saying, Al, I would like to explain, hey, Dutch Bachman, maybe you could send this letter. I would like to explain how to use the monofilament to make the perfect presentation. Well, I'm just pulling that out of the sky, but I would say, good, that's a good idea. And I would answer back, Dutch, here's what we're kind of looking at. Uh, in, in what would go into that book. That's what I want from you. Start. Let's start out with some query letters. Don't write a big, long dissertation that I'm going to have to say that just well, doesn't quite work. We'll see if there's enough interest and enough information out there yeah. that maybe I can learn how to make a good presentation. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you're up to get underwater. <laughs> I'm hoping for some help, guys. 
<laughs> anyway, we don't know whether this is going to be a fall flat on his face or not, but and we don't know whether we're going to do it in addition to Fly Tying Friday or on Fly Tying Friday. Again, to my knowledge, there's nobody out there writing books with their Zoom people. And um, and here's how, here's how the publishing would go. When you publish on Amazon, and that's what we would be doing, photographs have to be to certain standards, and we'd make sure that everybody understood what those standards are. We'd probably have some training classes for the author group, if you will. And uh, you're held to a certain number of words because it's an actual paper, and it's not a, a digital page. It's an actual page where you only can fit so many words on it along with the, with the photographs. So we'd work along through all of that with all of you. But if we get enough interest, uh, we'll go forward with it. If not, it's just one of those ideas that we thought we'd see if we couldn't come up with a fun together kind of a project, if you will. Not every idea we have no, gets sorry. published. <laughs> yeah, we, we've written like 20 some books and and probably outlined another 40. But And, and sometimes we get ideas and we talk about it, forget to write it down, then we can't remember what the idea was. And yeah, there's still one idea I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we <laughs> we had a, just a dynamite idea for a novel and it just, anyway, never mind. It, it, that's neither here nor there. Anyway, questions, comments. Are we crazy as heck? I don't know. Does it have to be Western fly fishing presentation or will you include Tenkara? Uh, Tenkara sounds good. Um, so I was just saying, I was just thinking tonight. I mean, I'd like to, th to know about a good presentation with a small fly that's a size two in the mangroves or or whatever. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a whole set of problems there that they deal with that those of us in Spring Creek don't even have a clue about. I'd like somebody help me catch one of those bass in uh, the, the Bruno Dunes that I worked on all day and never caught one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just laughed at it. Yeah, I think. You anyway, know, yeah. comments, ideas. Yeah this, yeah, this is Bill. I think it is a good idea because I think it's also a teaching guide, right, for for future generations, and that will allow them then to understand factors. Because I'm learning, okay, so just going to be right up front, like how tippet size, hook, what does the biology mean to what you're trying to catch, right? How does your line affect it? Like I'm trying to make like a little kit so people that are like in Project Healing Waters can learn how to tie various knots. Well, I'm finding certain monos have some really nasty little memory characteristics, right? And, yes. and so I think uh, along that line, you know, when you mention the fluorocarbons and everything else, there are lots of questions people who start off or even those that may have been around for a while and say, what's a good line? What is supple? What works well when I'm cold, hot? Because temperature of the water, right? And outdoor temperatures can affect how your mono uh, will lay out for the tippet. And that affects presentation. My, my response to that too is, is you have a whole range of things going from what's a good presentation for a beginner just a good overall thing if I'm just starting and then mm -hmm. going down to the person who really gets into the technical water temperature and and uh, all, all of that different stuff. So <clears throat> any you other comments? You almost have chapters for each um, sort of fish or even each um, sort of fly. Yeah, it's a uh... We're, we're looking at, at all of those uh, things. Maybe we need even widen the scope. I don't know. Uh, I know that we have some ideas here, and I just don't want to throw all the ideas out where we might stifle some other people's ideas. But, um, you know, there's a ton of things that cause a, fl a fly to do what it does in the water mm -hmm. based on the amount of lead in the, in the, on the hook. Yeah, the way the materials are positioned on that hook in relation to that lead uh, if it's a dry fly, uh, th those materials and how they're placed on the hook can cause a whole lot of things to happen, e either the way you want it. You, you know or what not. I just thought of oh, about dear. presentations? What's that? Remember that guy that used to make those birds and he would hold them out above the water? Oh, yes. Oh, for God. the bass to come up and get them. Have you ever seen that presentation? That's a different kind of presentation. These big old bass would come up, honk, 
And of course, he had no hook on it. So it was just, he was just playing with the fish. Said he'd gotten tired of catching fish. So that was what he did for entertainment. Those amazing videos. Wish we yeah, had those a, videos. It was, uh, Al, I know that, yeah. Al Dick Rurabaugh, uh, as you would know, and anybody who has fished Spring Creek's a good deal knows, presentation is the whole name of the game. There are a lot of interesting ways in which presentations work and don't work on the Spring Creeks. I think it'd make a great little page in the book. You know, that reminds me of that day we were talking about earlier when Al and I went on our anniversary. There was a, a fish rising across several different currents coming out from under uh, a weed pad. And it just, it looked like a really nice fish. <laughs> And there was no way, it was my turn to use the rod, but there was no way I had the ability to make that cast and time that across all of those different currents. So I let Al catch that fish and he did catch it, but it was, then it was so difficult to land the fish because of all those currents. He finally had to roll cast it off. And those, those are just kind of some of the funny things you get into. But I mean, the way he had the cast in order to get through all of that, and make that perfect drift timed right. I'll, I'll pay you a little bit later of the, oh, well, of the really positive comment. That, that, that's great, Gretchen. I could have said it better myself. Well, <laughs> you had a good guide. <laughs> right. That, well, another thing popped into my mind just now. Uh, when we were in the UK fishing um, uh, oh. when, uh, on a private spring creek there, uh, we found that some of our techniques here in the U.S. are actually, actually forbidden. As an example, a downstream dead drift on that particular body of water was a good way to get shot. I mean, they, they didn't take to it very kindly at all. They didn't shoot you, but they no, sure but, but, but they But they sure hollered at me a little bit. Yeah, they sure did. It's a, well, anyway, it's, it's, it, is that the kind of thing that goes in there? Is a good drift in one country a bad drift in another country? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, we have streams and we have lakes. Yep. So, you know, absolutely. We have different kinds of bodies of water and, you know, they behave differently. I mentioned to you how Storm Lake has changed, right? So now we've got weed patches to play in and presentation may affect me because I'm going to have to work my way through weed columns, right? And, you know, the idea of, you know, let's say a hook guard. I know that's a technical aspect, but I think those are things that, if people can get some ideas, I think we can encourage others to go into the sport. And I'm hoping for other veterans, they, if, if you think of how we do things in the military, you know, a long time ago, it wasn't that way, but then, you know, they changed. Everything kind of became, you know, some writing and a bunch of pictures. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have a picture book that kind of tells the story. And then you have multiple different books with multiple chapters. You know, kind of like an information guide. You know, you start off with a here's a basic eye guide to how to how to run yourself up. You know, you want to start yourself fly fishing and you know, some basic knots, and then you know, here's some hook sizes, yada yada yada. And I'm just 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 riffing here, and then you start driving into the technical chapters, right? You know, this is a, a, a brook fishing, this is lake fishing, this is river, um, you know, what to look for, just ideas because this is a great sport, fairly complex, right? A lot of technical items, but I don't know. I just think ideas. You can even combine video inside of this sure, with the book. Sure. Do you remember that casting that um, Gary used to do where he used, was it? Was it yeah, there was a couple of things LaFontaine showed us way back when. One, when he was writing the book, Fishing the High Mountain Lakes, I, I happened to be fishing with him. And he says, Al, I want to show you something. And what we, he lived in Deer Lodge, Montana at the time. And uh, at uh, 14 miles down the road, it was Warm Springs, Montana, uh, which is where he worked actually at Warm Springs. And there were a bunch of ponds there that were residue from the mining days. And he called it blow line technique. Yeah. And what he did is he would take just backing and put it on his fly rod, put a fly on there, get the wind to his back, which over in that part of Montana, the wind never stopped blowing. It just changed directions. So 
you just kind of hold your rod up in the air and then gradually let your fly flutter down to the water. And you could dance it all over the place with this blow line technique of his. It was absolutely deadly when you could get the wind working in the direction that you needed to have it work. It was the perfect presentation. I had forgotten all about that until you mentioned that. But well, that's the kind of thing yeah. that... Yeah, those are some know, things that'd be it, fun to write about. Yeah. And he wrote about it in the Fishing the High Mountain Lakes, which yeah, is a well, book that he published back in the early 80s, as I recall. Quote him on that. <clears throat> so, oh, hey, I guess... Al. Yeah. Hey, Al. I, uh, I probably read it in, in the same book you read it, uh, that blow line. I recall that he used, he or whoever wrote the, what I re read, they used dental floss. So and That's correct. what I was thinking, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so I, that's I went out and bought a bunch of dental floss, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> all, all I can tell you is that I, I tried the dental floss, and that's why I said fly line backing. is. A, uh, I, I'm not talking about 30-pound backing. I'm talking like 15. That seems to work pretty good. It did for me. But I can tell you that floss, it was so fluffy, that big stuff. I You couldn't control it. I mean, it's a... Thank, thank you. You just saved me a big hassle day. Uh, you would have... Oh no! It would have been a real tangle, and then you would have you had you'd have found out, did you? Could have went and got something else for it. So, <laughs> there's another thing that Gary did in one of his books. It was called the yo-yo technique. Oh yeah, that's right. And he would tie a, a nymph, let's say a, a damsel nymph, with foam in the body, so it would try to float. And when he he would fish it on a sink tip with a short leader, so that he could drag the sink tip through the weeds, but the fly was suspended above the weeds. And what he was doing is, as he would drag the weighted line through the weeds, it would chase insects out of those weeds, and they'd go swimming away because they got spooked out. And basically what he was doing is creating a chum line. That's what I was going to say. He was chumming. <laughs> and and I, I'll never forget to say, I forget who the guy was, one of the fly shop owners over in in uh, central Montana. Anyway, neither here nor there. But they had a contest going in these ponds just outside of uh, outside of Warm Springs. Uh, and Gary said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to run a, a damsel nymph through here, and I'm going to outfish you all day long. And he did. Huh. He told me the trick. Well, and he wrote about it later, but he told me the trick, and that was the the yo-yo technique. And he was he was chumming the water with the stuff he scared out of the weeds, and then his fly was just up above the weeds. Hmm. Anyway. Al, Gretchen, he, uh, yes. I, I weigh in here. The... Um... Y'all have com created a community here, uh, not just people watching fly tying, but you've got kind of a community going on here. And anything that can gather the experiences of people that can be used to share with others so they can learn this great sport and, and benefit from that to become better uh, fly fishers is a good idea. Uh, one other idea is um, I don't use weighted flies, and I, it sounds kind of a heretic to say that, but uh, it's it's kind of what you referred to with Tim Flagler in allowing a fly to look and act like a natural insect. Mm -hmm. And if you learn to use split shot and length of tippets and so forth, you you don't need a weighted Absolutely. fly. Even, even to fish into a bucket, yeah, pocket water. So there's a lot of things like this, and, and there's a lot of things anglers learn about presenting or suspending a fly at various locations within the water column to be more effective under certain conditions. So I think you're on to a good idea. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun. And it's people like the one you just came up with just now, and not too far off of others that I've, that I've heard, but the thing is, we have expert fly fishers here on this call and listening in on the live stream to Facebook and for and tomorrow after I post the video on YouTube that will will come up with ideas and our challenge will be probably filtering through a thousand ideas to select the the dozen to twenty or so that we do to make it a, a book of about the size that we need. We may find that we need to do more than one book. This we, may be a mistake. You remember how many flies we had in our living room when we were doing the encyclopedia? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, we, <laughs> yeah that was, the, we asked for some participation and, 
and God, they would deliver them by the truckload. And I'm, I'm BSing <laughs> on that, but it was a lot of flies showed up in our living room. But, <laughs> it was fun. Now, let me let me let me just say this: as as, as somebody that works with veterans extensively, and 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 Bill Clumper is one of those. I think this is an exceptionally fine idea because I remember when I first started and I've got young men out here that are disabled and trying to figure out how to teach them good fly fishing so that they can catch fish is important. And I, I, I'm just, yeah, I'm all in on this one, my friend. All Thank right. you. We might have here, some here. special ideas for them. You know, and there's some other things in writing a book other than being the person that writes it. So you're not a great writer. I think I know several people that are not great writers and they're awful darn good copy editors. And I'll tell you what, that's, that's it. That's the most important job is the, is the copy editor. <laughs> I'm hitting him. You can't see that. Yeah, right. Anyway, the copy editor, because the clean edit or the clean text that goes out to the public is either good or bad based on the copy editor. So this old English teacher can be pretty, pretty severe. Yeah. yeah I can come up with a whole lot of stuff, but she, she can be brutal with my writing when she says, <laughs> This don't even make sense. What the hell are you trying to say? <laughs> You're the perfect team. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> well, we think so. But anyhow, I'm glad to hear that at least there's some interest. I'll be looking for emails. Uh, again, there won't be any. Uh, okay. There won't be any uh, play time Friday. Next Friday, we're going to take off again after that. We're going to use some of the things that we were even talking about. One of the things that I want to start the presentation after this well, two weeks out is upside down flies. Uh -huh. Oh, I've not seen anything on upside down flies. And um, there's a whole lot of challenges to go with upside down flies. But I'll tell you what, three of the best flies in my fly box are upside down flies. And what makes them so doggone good is the position they take in the water and that they have a wing that will collapse quickly enough and easily enough to allow the fish to be hooked. I can tie a beautiful upside down fly that will land perfect on the water every time, and you'll miss every single fish because the wing's too stiff. You know, so there's a whole lot of things that go into material selection in an upside down fly that you don't on a regular dry fly. And so we're going to do some something on that just, just for the fun of it. And it might even be something that crosses over into the book as far as you know you don't have to wait until next year when you come up with ideas write them down and, and get them to us get we'll them put, to us and we'll, we'll put them start, into a file and folder start working on some yeah. stuff uh, because the sooner we start it the easier it is going to be to to do it I, that sounds strange but if you wait till the last minute it it is overwhelming whereas if we can kind of stream some of this out so well, once i get the greenhouse bill i'll i can start yeah. doing some stuff and we also have a thing all you can you can probably see in our feed let me show you one of the things that we can do we've got that to test stuff out and that's cool if we have ideas of things that we think might work we want to see what a presentation looks like in the water well we can do it and that's uh that's the pool. Have and we tried taking I, pictures of that? I, I no, I haven't. And that's we had we had to work on that. We, yeah, we've got to do it right now. It's just we've been doing the Zoom yeah. stuff on it. Hey, okay. Al, go for yeah. here. You know, Berkeley used to do a lot of fish tank stuff. Remember that up in Spirit Lake? Yeah, sure did. <clears throat> so you know, I'm just throwing out an idea. Would could they possibly be a resource for? some pictures and presentations I know would be using their line, uh, you know, don't want to get stuck with any specific brand, but just the, trying to think outside all, the box. It's all very possible. Hey, eh? yeah. again, I don't know. This is just, this is just a wild yeah. idea that may go flop right in its face or may actually come to come to fruition. We've, we've, hit, we've been kicking this around for a, a quite a while. And uh, the photographs that I showed you about the, the hatching of the mayfly was the, the impetus that told me, you know, we have a lot of talent out here. And creative in, minds. In creative <laughs> minds of the people that we get to come. We had the pleasure of coming in contact and it, and with. And a few warped. 
Thanks, everyone, for joining us. For now, that's a wrap. See you next time.